And I thank the gentleman. And I recognize Ms. Delbonet for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Director Comey, for, for being here and for your service. I know as a acting AG, you demonstrated a commitment to the Fourth Amendment and protecting Americans' privacy despite enormous pressure to do otherwise. And you've mentioned in your original testimony and, and in other comments that the rule of law and the Fourth Amendment is the spine of the FBI, and so I appreciate that commitment. I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions about the FBI's use of aircraft. Um, the FBI deployed aircraft over Ferguson last year in response to requests from local law enforcement. Is that correct? Yes. Um, does the FBI respond to these types of requests frequently? Quite well, thank goodness there aren't uh, the kind of uh, turmoil and pain in communities frequently, but sure, if local law enforcement asks for help, in getting a look at a developing situation, we will offer that help. We've done it in Baltimore. We did it in Ferguson, as I recall. And what criteria have to be met for, um, for the FBI to send aerial resources to assist local law enforcement, or who makes that decision? It's made at a fairly high level in the FBI. Um, I think at the SA, special agent in charge level, at least, uh, that is the commander of the field office. So it has to go up through a variety of checks uh, before it can be approved. And what are the criteria that you use to make that decision? I think it has to be uh, part of a open investigation of ours or part of our an open assistance to law enforcement matter. So it has to, I'm gonna, we can get you the particulars of our policy, but as you know, the Bureau has a policy for everything. So there's a there's a series of, of uh, steps that have to be walked through to make sure it's part of either an open case of ours or it's a legitimate open assistance to law enforcement matter. Okay, thank you, I'd appreciate the information. Um, your staff also acknowledged that the FBI, quote, routinely uses aviation assets in support of predicated investigations targeting specific individuals and when requested and appropriate in support of state and local law enforcement, end quote. Um, that's a, you know, why, why, is this, why is it so important to stress this distinction when it appears that these, it's kind of more generalized type of surveillance? I'm sorry, the distinction? The distinction that you have in this, you know, in this, the feedback from, from your staff that you use aviation assets in support of predicated investigations targeting specific individuals when in the ca these cases of local law enforcement, et cetera, it seems to be more generalized type of surveillance. Oh, I see. Well, I think we're just trying to explain how we use it. We don't, we don't fly planes around America looking down trying to figure out if somebody might be doing something wrong. The overwhelming use of our aircraft is a pilot flies as part of an investigation to help us follow a spy, a terrorist, or a criminal. And then with local law enforcement, if there is tremendous turbulence in a community, it's useful to everybody, civilians and law enforcement, to have a view of what's going on. Where are the fires in this community? Where are people gathering? Where do people need help? And sometimes the best view of that is above rather than trying to look from a, a car on the street. And um, do you feel that warrants are necessary when you're targeting specific individuals, especially when you have aircraft equipped with new technologies like high resolution cameras? I don't think so. I, mean, I, I meant what I said about the Fourth Amendment. We're not collecting the content of anybody's communication or engaging anything besides following somebody when we do that investigation. So we do it, as I said, we've done it since the Wright brothers with planes, um, and we do it in cars, we do it on foot, and the law is pretty clear that you don't need a warrant for that kind of observation. But now that there are technology changes, I think even the most recent course case, um, you know, Florida versus Riley was in 1989, there's been a lot of changes in technology and so it's not just what you might see with the human eye anymore. Um, so are there other types of technologies? And do you think warrant standards should be in place when you have other types of technologies that might be in use on these aircraft? I suppose if, if you were putting technology on an FBI aircraft that had Fourth Amendment implications, that is that it was uh, reaching someone's communications or looking within a dwelling or something like that, it would have Fourth Amendment implications. But that, that's not what we use the aircraft for. Um, so what led to the decision to seek court orders when aircraft are equipped with Stingray technology? Right, whenever we use, I think we have one aircraft that we can put uh, Stingray technology on it, that is self, cell site simulators, um, and I suppose we can mount it on others if we had a court order to do it, but that we've decided as a matter of policy, now the whole Department of Justice does this, 
that if we're going to be operating a cell site simulator, it has Fourth Amendment implications, so we will get a warrant for that. So whether that's on the ground or an airplane, we treat it the same way. You said you decided. Do you feel like that you're required by law to do that? I think we made that move before uh, it was, there was even a, a divide among opinions in the courts. Some courts have said you need it for that, some not. We went nationwide with a requirement for warrants. There's been no uh, national decision on that, no Supreme Court level decision on that. But we just think given that some courts are requiring it, we do it across the country. Thank you. My time's expired. No, thank you, gentlemen.